Good morning. Today we have Sachi Trivedi with 12 years of investment experience. Sachi is a portfolio manager with Trident Capital Investments, a long only Indian public equities ESG fund fashioned along the lines of Warren Buffett's original partnership. Sachi is the founder and CIO at Trident and has over 17 years of experience in financial services in New York and London as well. She was a fund manager in the global equities team of Columbia Threadneedle Investments. Also, she was a management consultant at KPMG and an engineer at Samsung. Sachi has a B Tech degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, a master's in science degree in EE from the University of Maryland, and an MBA from Columbia. Welcome, Sachi. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's late over there, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, one of the things when I was reading about your background, and I found it really interesting about, you know, how you've built your firm and, you know, your fund strategy is taking the long-term view of your holdings and concentrating investments. Maybe you can go a little bit deeper and explain to folks, you know, what are you looking for before building a long-term holding and how do you think about your portfolio overall? Sure. So um, I'll just give a, a, a slight sort of context to, you know, to this way of thinking. Um, when I was uh, launching my fund, you know, when I was thinking about it, and just so that, you know, this has been like a decade in the making, you know, in my brain. <laughs> and, you know, it came um, alive on paper uh, much later than that. But I had been thinking about this for, for, for almost a decade uh, prior. And what I... Like I went to a business school, uh, you know, at Columbia Business School, and so you know, I'm very my thinking is very much shaped um, by Warren Buffett's thinking, which is basically that you do not treat stocks as pieces of paper to be traded. You treat them as you you think of yourself as an owner, and you know, stocks as businesses that you own, and therefore you own them for the long term. You only own if you understand them, and then you kind of own them for the long term. You know, this is not to be you know traded in and out. Um, every day and that so that had really shaped my thinking what got me even more sort of excited about the strategy was that i found there were companies in india that had returned better returns than let's say a google Okay. since its inception and we don't think about it we i most of the people would never imagine this most of the people have never heard of an indian company you know that has returned more than google and i think the the reason for that is because nobody or majority of the people particularly when they go to emerging markets or, or a country like india they just want to you know shoot for the fences and they just leave that conservatism the traditionalism you know sort of in the Western markets, and you know, they just want to hit for the fences. Uh, and, and I thought that is where I could add value and you know, sort of bring, uh, uh, you know, generate alpha, bring superior returns to my investors if I can take the philosophy of Mr. Buffett and apply it to India, because I think there are a lot of similarities in where India is today and where the US was in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and clearly, Mr. Buffett's philosophy worked beautifully at the time. So that was a starting point, if you will, you know, the genesis of, um, uh, you know, the foundation of Triton Capital. Now, more specifically, therefore, our strategy is very, very long term oriented, um, very concentrated, because I do not believe you can um, understand or have high conviction in 100 stocks. I mean, you'd be lucky to have it in 25 stocks. So, so that was just, you know, an outcome of that thinking and that strategy. And again, we look at uh, uh, these companies, uh, you know, as we look at ourselves as partial owners. And therefore, for example, we would not invest in anything that we do not, or, or whose business model we don't understand, you know, what it would look like in 10 years time. Yeah. So, Therefore, that is how, you know, the strategy. So we are long-term oriented, very concentrated fund, very uh, uh, focused on the business model and, you know, the competitive modes around it. And how do you think about the macro then? So not just for India in particular, but obviously in a year like 2022, when one of the only sectors globally really doing well was energy, right? So how do you think about you know, you can find individually great positions and obviously you do the math, you'd have to have at least 4% uh, 
um, on average in a, in a position, or you might have smaller ones and you know more con more highly concentrated ones. But how do you think about putting the concentrated positions together, and how there might be you know concentrated factors that aren't fundamental in dealing with that in your portfolio? Right. So I'm a very straightforward answer to that, and I would not mince my words. <laughs> and, I've said, and I've said this to my investors: we will underperform in such years because we would not we we would not invest in these companies. And when I say these companies, quote unquote, I'm not demonizing energy, but the energy companies that I see in India, I just do not find the same attractive metrics and return profile, you know, that I look for in companies that uh, make their way into our, uh, into the portfolio. Um, so we will underperform in these years. And taking a step back, um, another thing which I feel holding yourself to a benchmark is dangerous enough in developed markets. But I think you can get away with it because, for example, in S&P 500, it's a fairly efficient market. The uh, index itself is, you know, fairly diversified. So yes, you know, it, you can, you know, hold yourself to that benchmark, that yardstick. But I think in emerging market countries, it's dangerous. So, for example, the leading India in Indian index is Nifty. Nifty has got or, or uh, Sensex. Sensex has got 30 companies, Nifty has got 50 companies. That can very quickly get overwhelmed uh, by, you know, an energy boom or, you know, any kind of a cyclical rally. And if you try to, you know, use that same yardstick to your portfolio uh, performance, I think you are playing with fire because you're chasing where the puck is going when you should be, I, I just feel it's a recipe for disaster. So we would, we don't do that. Um, and we are very, we'll be the first ones to say we are going to underperform in such markets. And when you think about the, whether it's sectors or sub industries, are there certain ones that you stay away from certain ones you find that you're, you know, finding more attractive business models and management teams, you know, what would someone expect from looking at your portfolio over time? Sure. So longevity is a key, um, I guess, consideration for the portfolio. So if we do not understand, uh, you know, the business model today, or if we do not understand how a company would look like in 10 years or 20 years time, then I think we have a problem, uh, you know, we would not invest. So we therefore um, look at, I would say, rather simpler business models. So we don't chase um fads which we, we don't chase any you know so for example fintech can be a huge fad you know so we would not we, we we would not be chasing anything you know that we don't find that we don't understand then corporate governance is a key to longevity because it's very quick uh, you can destroy longevity of your enterprise or uh, of shareholder returns by poor corporate governance so corporate governance is something you know it's like the first um I would say, you know, three weeks of work that we do is based on corporate governance. So that's something we focus on from, uh, on very much. And in a country like India, the ESG, I would say, is not a marketing gimmick. It's a real need. For example, India is a country, you know, with receding water tables. There are increasing uh, instances of droughts in certain parts of the country and floods in certain other parts of the country. And if you are a paints company, where the your key raw material is water and you tell me in the middle of like june that you have run out of water <laughs> it's 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 not an esg problem it's a business problem and you know and if you tell me you were waiting for government to somehow you know provide water to you then i think you have a business problem so it is these kind of things you know that we would look at very carefully because you would not sustain the business would not sustain for de decades if you are not focused on it today and when you think about concentrating your capital, do you leg into positions? Do you weight some more than other ones? How do you think about managing individual positions um, independently and then versus other positions in your portfolio? Sure. So the way we think about portfolio construction is we 50% of our portfolio uh, would be in what we call as core companies. These are very, these are companies with strong operating histories, you know, uh, running over decades. Uh, very strong corporate governance. These are market share leaders with very attractive proven return profile, but most importantly, with the added uh, 
leg room for redeploying, you know, the, the capital that they generate into, you know, into the business or into a uh, similarly attractive opportunities. So this forms a core of our fund. Uh, but then given the size of these companies from a growth perspective, they would be, you know, GDP plus. Yeah. Um, then 30% of a portfolio would be in very, very boring companies, you know, which we call as plumbing stocks. And these companies are, you know, like your ratings agencies, uh, ingredients companies, the depository. These companies are never going to be at the forefront of uh, defining an industry, you know, pen uh, increasing penetration of the industry. But these are critical uh, components of, you know, if India has to become a $10 trillion economy from a $3.5 trillion today, you know, then these companies A, will survive and B, massively thrive, but they will never be at the forefront. Uh, and they would almost, what I would call as be like sort of sort of shallow cyclical. So they would also track GDP okay. uh, up and down. And the final 20% of our portfolio is what we call as pioneer companies, uh, pioneer stocks. These are newer business models. Now, in the case of India, these would be insurance companies and asset managers, because these are highly underpenetrated sectors in India. Um, there's a lot of change happening in the sector. The competitive landscape is evolving every day. The regulatory landscape is evolving every day. So we, uh, but the growth, you know, they have um, probably a decade or more of hyper growth ahead of them. The margin profile would be, you know, up and down because depending on how much they invest in that growth. So that would be 20%. So 50% core, 30% plumbing and 20%, um, you know, uh, this uh, pioneer uh, category. This is how we think about portfolio construction. Now, having said that, this is our initial portfolio construction. Okay. Ultimately, we will let our winners run. So if a pioneer company, you know, starts becoming bigger part of a portfolio, we would not stop it. We would not trim it. Uh, we would just let it run. And this is exactly what Mr. Buffett has done as well. And, you know, we feel comfortable uh, with that strategy. And so how do you decide on trimming or exiting for non-fundamental reasons? Like, do you ever do it on valuation? Do you have price targets? How do you think about the duration of a hold? So we don't do price targets. Uh, what we focus on at all points in time is the business model and the competitive mode. Now, what that means is that if we have invested in a company where we believe, you know, we are expecting strong returns on capital. For us, that would mean like 20% plus. And we see that either the competitive landscape, ha landscape has dramatically changed. There is substitution effect. There is some regulatory, you know, sort of overlay that is uh, decimating the returns. That for us would be a reason to exit. We would not exit on uh, valuation or, you know, just because a company has, you know, run 50% in a year. For us, that's fine. It's so Sachi, it's been a fairly exciting start to the year after what I'd call an exciting 2022 in the markets. Um, we're in a low ball situation, but arguably there could be really great variants of what's going to happen with the growth in GDP and inflation, currency, so many different things, as well as, you know, uh, large potential geopolitical events. So kind of putting that to the side and looking at your portfolio now, is there a core name that you could talk about that's been in your portfolio for a while? And then looking ahead, either a newer investment that you just made or specific themes that you're looking at that are interesting that you're prioritizing right now? Sure. Um, so the, a couple of things, themes that we are very excited about irrespective of everything else that's happening on uh, happening around the world is um, financialization and consumption in India. Now, financial, financialization, I think it has, you know, decades long legs in the country. I mean, the private credit to GDP ratio is around, I think, 55%. The world average is like 144%. China is like three, three and a half times of that. Even like South Korea is three times of that. So there's a lot of room, you know, there to grow. And whether you, if you look at like sort of asset management today, I think only 4% of Indians participate in stock markets in any shape or form. So again, this, it goes only one way. Life insurance, I think the under insurance in India is to the tune of 83%. So those are very large numbers, very large numbers. And when you think that these numbers are for 1.4 billion people, these are even larger still. 
So, so we're very excited about this, uh, this theme as a whole. Um, secondly, consumption, and I'll just give you, uh, you know, one data point, which is just think for yourself, how many pairs of footwear do you buy in a year? Now, for we're not there uh, for me. I'm low, but my we have three kids, so I would say as a family, we buy a lot because we've got three teenagers or keep growing. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, for India, that number is 1.9 per capita. I think that is low by any stretch of imagination. The global average is, I think, to the tune of 3.5, yeah. and uh, in the Western world, we are looking at six, seven. So there's clearly, you know, a lot of room for growth in either financialization or consumption themes. And I think there's a lot of new themes that are waiting, you know, to be or to, you know, come to the fore in India. But again, as very conservative investors, I think we would be late to that party. So we would not join in, you know, unless we understand what's going on. But um, watch the space. I think ESG space is going to be extremely interesting in India. And when you think about the ESG space, is it about changing the governance of, of businesses or is it um, businesses around ESG helping other businesses become better? When you, know, when you say that it's interesting and that it's something to watch, is it because you know, water is a risk? Is it more on the risk side? Is it more on the opportunity side? Um, what are you seeing as the trajectory? See, I, think, I think it is both. Now, there, there was a study, you know, that was done a couple of years ago, and basically it said that if the world's population consumed like Americans do, we would I think, need like five Earths or seven Earths or some, some such number. I think it was seven Earths. And the world's population consumed, you know, like I think Europeans, it was five Earths, like Chinese, it was three Earths. And if the world's population consumed like the way Indians do, then we would need only 70% of our earth. Now, I mean, that really gives you a pause, you know, for, for thinking. But, but realistically speaking, today, the penetration, for example, of cars in India, only about 10, 15% of households in India have cars. And we are talking 260 million households in total in India. So only like 20, 25 million cars, you know, are there in the country. Compare that to US, which has got almost two cars per household. You see the state of traffic, you see the state of pollution, you think about how cars are manufactured, what it takes, how they are disposed of, uh, and what is happening with 25 million cars. And if you take it to the US level and make it like sort of 500 million cars, I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's possible. And you can do this on literally any metric. You think about waste generation. So today India has far, far lower waste generation per capita than let's say a US. But then, you know, the Western countries, you know, for decades, you know, have been packaging the waste and sending it to the shores of, you know, China or Thailand. They would not, they would not be a country that would be able to take on the waste that and a country the size of Indian population would generate. So I think a lot has to, and this poses both a risk and an and opportunity. And if you sort of, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm passionate about, you know, economic history. And if you look at, you know, history, every um, country that has gone on to become a superpower has done so on the back of a technological revolution. Sure. And I think India will be no different. It, um, the risk is, India has some of the hardest questions to find answers to, whether it is energy generation, energy consumption, waste management, um, healthcare, you know, sort of uh, yeah. dispersal of healthcare, credit. I think all of these, uh, education, I think um, these are some of the most difficult questions that, you know, we are facing, you know, as, as earthlings. And I think India will have to find answers to these questions, you know, if they can become or if they can fully, uh, uh, you know, realize their economic potential. Right. But seeing how much entrepreneurship and how much, you know, startup, or how developed the startup ecosystem is and how energetic that startup ecosystem is, I think I'm more bullish than bearish. Seeing how much focus the Indian government is placing on these issues. Again, I'm more bullish than bearish, but then it's, you know, if you solve the problem. Big problem. Well, these are big problems, right? Many big problems. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to circle back to something you talked about at the beginning, which was governance and how you spend the first few weeks thinking about governance. 
Is it similar since you've been a global investor, you know, previously focused around the world, now focused in India? Is it similar to what you look at in for other countries? Are there things unique to Indian companies that you're looking at? Or is there a type of due diligence that you can do being in country that maybe somebody out of country can't do? It'd be great to just unpack that a little bit about what are you looking for? What's the type of work that you do? Sure. So as I mentioned, you know, India is similar to the U.S. of 1950s and 60s. And one of the things that, you know, U.S. faced then and India has now is that majority of the companies are owned by the founder families. Now, and we are talking to the tune of 50, 60, 70 percent ownership of the company is with the founder family. That is again, both a risk as and an opportunity, because I think founders have the zeal and the long term view that, you know, professional managers perhaps uh, do not have, you know, they live quarter to quarter. But then if founders do not have the integrity or if they do not safeguard the interest of minority shareholders, then it's a huge problem. Uh, this is quite different, I would say, compared to the US now, which is mostly professionally run and owned. So I think that is a, a I would say a slightly unique situation in India and um, it's a hard one to evaluate. So our work is basically to see how, you know, the founders have treated minority shareholders in the past, uh, related party transactions, and most importantly, reputation. I think in these matters, reputation matters a lot and which is why, you know, having feet on the street is the only way, you know, we can, um, uh, you know, mitigate some of that risk. So in the first three weeks, the only thing I'm doing is, or my analysts who are based in India, we are doing is we're just calling people and just asking, you know, hey, have you heard of these guys? What do you think? So on and so forth. That's really helpful. Sorry. And so, you know, looking back at your career and whether it's, you know, for Trident here or if you're thinking, you know, for your, your time before that, what's one of the greatest lessons that you've learned in investing? See, uh, I'm, I'll give my geeky side away here. Um, so I'm an engineer, right, by qualification. Um, so I'm very mathematically oriented. And, you know, I always thought, uh, or perhaps when I started my journey as an investor, one of the things, one of the things that allured me into it was I thought this is so, you know, mathematically oriented. There's only one right answer. And, you know, um, you, you do your sort of DCF nicely and, you know, uh, and, and there, there is truth, there's some truth in that, it's only some. But I think that I have increasingly gotten more and more aware and appreciative of the qualitative side of it. Both qualitative assessment of the stocks of the businesses and the qualitative, um, you know, the, the journey that you go through in your gut when you when you own a stock and then and it goes down or when you own a stock and it goes up 50 percent then what do you do and i think that emotional resilience uh, is 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 probably far more important than you know getting that dcf right yeah and, it, and it's not easy it comes with time um but it's underappreciated Right. And I always, you know, I've got kids. I tell my kids, mom gets things wrong every day. Right. It's like, and, and you have to be able to live with that. It's a certain kind of personality that can be okay with that. Yeah. And then say, okay, was that luck or unluck? Was that, you know, lack of skill, something that we didn't take into consideration? Yeah. Um, and then what are you going to learn from that? Can you apply that to other work that you're doing? Or is that a one-off, you know, that you kind of tuck away somewhere else, but that's a very important quality for, someone who, especially if you're thinking long-term for investing, but if you want a longevity in even your career, you have to be able to get through that. No, absolutely. And I think very, most often when we think about this, we think about, oh, if your stock has gone down 50%, then what do you, what do, you do? And I think, I think emotionally, if your stock has gone down 50%, you are perhaps more uh, likely to stick to it because you know it's you don't want to a, uh, admit your mistake and b you know you're like at least let me break even and you know then I will sell. I think that is maybe a tad easier, but when your stock goes up hundred percent in a matter of like nine months, then what do you do? And and that and that's a harder one. And at least I mean you know that it will not go up hundred percent next year also, you know. And then then what do you do? And when we look at our stocks and you know, when we do our valuations, 
we don't think about 20% upside or 30% upside. We basically think about, you know, how many baggers do we believe, you know, this is going to be over our holding horizon of, let's say, 10, 20 years. So we think in terms of, you know, uh, multiples of uh, its current value. And you, we kind of have to keep kicking the tires on that and making sure that we are, we are true and honest to that thesis. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Sachi, how can people, you know, stay in tune with the investments you're making, your career? You know, how do they get in touch with you? If you could let us know uh, so that folks can follow up with you, what's the best way? Okay, so again, my geeky side is I'm I'm quite introvertish, so I'm not on social media. I never tweet. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on. Inst I actually don't even have an Instagram account. So I think that um, probably rules out many, many <laughs> younger people. And they have a website. <laughs> I do have a website, but um, I think get in touch with me. Um, I think LinkedIn. Um, it's it's open for people to connect with me on LinkedIn. So definitely do that. And if you have a burning question, you can please email me as well at sachi at tridentcapitalinvest.com. Um, I do check my emails. I'm the one who's responding to those emails. So uh, yes, please uh, feel free to email. That's totally fine. Perfect. Thank you so much and for sharing your experience and your specific thoughts on the market in India, how you're applying ESG. There's so many nuggets in there. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And you have a good one.